Hare Krishna. I'm grateful to be here amongst all of you today. And I'll speak in four parts on this topic of responsible relationships. Responsible relationships means relationships in which responsible. We are able to choose our responses effectively. So today I'll speak within that on the topic of hurt people, hurt people. And I'll speak this in three parts. I'll make three main points today. And after each point, I will pause. And if you have any comments, reflections, or questions, feel free to ask. And then I'll move to the next point. So, hurt people, hurt people. <clears throat> that means that when people act, especially in close relationships, in a way that hurts someone close to them, then that is often because they themselves are hurting. And there was a... So, there was a European philosopher who was asked, what is your conception of hell? And he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God or heaven or hell. So when he had asked, what is your conception of hell? He said, hell means other people. Hell means other people. So he was a loner, he just couldn't get along with people. So he said that, oh, getting along with people is hellish. In fact, relationships are a source of can be a source of great distress. Actually, other people can be hell and other people can also be heaven. Sometimes if a relationship goes well, then we get a lot of shelter and joy in that relationship. <clears throat> so, we experience a huge gamut of emotions in our relationship, both positive emotions and negative emotions. So the first point I'll make is that, as I said, that when people hurt us, at that time, instead of focusing on why are they hurting me, we can understand to understand how they themselves are hurt. Say so suppose we are walking along a, we are walking through a room, and there's a crowd, there's a crowd of people nearby, and while we are walking along, suddenly. Somebody pushes us and we lose it and then about to fall down. Why did this person push me like this? We may get angry. But then, if we notice that actually we had put our, we are about to put our foot on that person, on that person's foot. And they pushed us in self defense. So then, their, their action becomes understandable. So when, so this is an example of how hurt people hurt people. That when that person feels, oh, my, you're, putting, you're stepping on my foot, you will hurt me, and I push you. And then we may fall down, we may injure ourselves, we get hurt. But hurt people hurt people. So whenever a person is acting in a way that is hurting us, our response first is, why are they hurting me like this? And that is a natural human response. Just like if you want to fall, our first response is we want to protect ourselves from the fall. But then, after that, okay, why did this person do like this? Then we have to look, maybe they were hurting in some way. And that's why they did that to me. I talk about this topic based on certain pastimes from the Ramayana and also from the Mahabharata and other epics. Now if you look at the Ramayana, in the Ramayana, we see that the, uh, that the characters, they at one level have very sweet loving relationships. Ram, Lakshman, Bharat, Chatru, they are all joyfully together. And just having one son would have given Dashrut Maharaj great joy. 
because he didn't have any children for a long time. Having four sons was a matter of even greater joy for him. And on top of that, to have four sons who so lovingly bonded with each other, that gave him immense joy. But something happened which ruined his joy. What was that? KK, what did she do? Uh, she asked Ram to be exiled. And just when Dashrath Maharaj seemed to be about to have the greatest joy of his life, you know, for a parent, for a father, uh, the joy of life is to see one son, child, one son, one son become a worthy successor. But for him, it was a moment of great celebration that his son was going to inherit the kingdom. But at that time, when Kaiki made this terrible demand, it sent round the forest. And not just for a few months, how long was it? 14 years. It was unbearably long. And then the other demand was make her son, this is Bharat, the king instead of Ram. So this was shocking for him. Now if we look back, at one level, it is outrageous action. She hurt Dashrath Maharaj so much that Dashrath Maharaj couldn't maintain his life at that time. And he gave up his life in trying to, in separation from Ram. So now let's look back. If we consider why did Kaiki do this? What do you think? Why did Kaiki do this? Why did Kaiki ask for these two terrible benedictions? What are your thoughts? Okay, one by to fulfill her desire. What are the desire? My son should be. My son should become the king. Yes, some other answer? You said something. Influence of bad association. That is specifically? Mantara. Yes. Any other reasons? The two prominent reasons, isn't it? Now if we consider how people act. So generally there are multiple layers of desires or motivations whenever we act. So if we see an ocean in which water is flowing, the current is flowing in a particular direction. Now for us, you might just feel the current is flowing this way. But actually in the current, there may be many different layers. And at different layers, the water may be flowing less or more forcefully in a particular direction. Sometimes, the water may be flowing like this at the surface. But in the opposite direction, it may be flowing below the surface. There can be multiple levels of currents or multiple levels of water flow with currents flowing in same direction or opposite directions. So we can see that at one that her desire was that my son should become the king. Certainly she was influenced by Mantra also, no doubt. But at another level, how did Mantra influence her? Or why did she have the desire that my son should become the king? Generally, when we look for an answer, the, the, we can keep questioning a particular answer to a deeper and deeper level. Because so yes, she had both his answers correct. However, why did she desire that her son should become the king? Isn't that a natural desire for a mother? That my son should become the king? Yes, it was. But then, why did that desire awaken at that particular point alone? It was not that Dashrath Maharaj suddenly informed out of the blue that Ram is going to become the king. It was more or less understood. Yes, the specific announcement was made quite rapidly. And then it was translated into action also rapidly. But in general, it was understood. Because in those times, the principle of primogeniture was followed. Primogeniture means that if in a family there are many children, then the oldest will become the inheritor. That was standard practice. 
So it was not that Kaike did not know about this. So what was it at that particular time that goaded her, that impelled her to act in this way? So it was her own insecurity, her own fear. What was her insecurity about? Yes, thank you. That she will not be the favorite queen anymore. Although she had been, she, she was the youngest among the queens, she was the attractive, and the Shukmana attracted, most attracted to her. So she, despite being youngest, had become his favorite queen. And she had got a position of privilege in the royal palace. And now, this tension between the queens, in Kaika and Kaushalya, it was there. But Kaushalya was, although she was the oldest queen, she was not very possessive about her position. She was understanding. And naturally, to some extent, she felt hurt that her position uh, had been displaced. But overall, they were living amicably. But here, this fear that I will lose my position, as the favorite queen. That was a weak point within her psyche. So, she, so for example, if say, somebody uh, catches us and say somebody catches us and pulls us. Now, if if they pull us, we can pull back. If they catch our hand and pull, come this way. Now, we say, I don't want to, we can pull back. But suppose they are pulling us with this, suppose somebody is pulling me with my right hand. And recently I had a fracture in the right hand. And I am recovering, but as, even a slight pull over there is unbearable. So normally if somebody would pull me, I could pull back. But if they pull me from the right hand, then just to avoid that pain, I will get put. So in her case, this was that insecurity that I may lose my position. That was a weak spot within her. And then, when that weak spot was exploited, when she was pulled at that weak spot, she just couldn't resist it. She just couldn't resist. She just pulled, and yes, oh, I have this favorite position. And who, who did the pulling for her? Mantara. So Mantara told her that you have been the favorite queen. Now when Kaushalya's son becomes the king, she will extract revenge against you. She will make you her maidservant. And your Ram will make your son his servant. Like Ram may even threaten you, threaten your son. He may imprison Bharat. He may exile Bharat. He may execute Bharat. Now, none of these scenarios were, were even the least probable. But when that insecurity was there, when that pain was there already, she couldn't think. She just got carried away by that. So when Somebody is hurt at that time, at that time, they may do things which may hurt others. So she did this because she was also, also insecure. She was, she was privileged, but her fear, her pain was that I will lose my privilege. And that feeling hurt her so much that she went about hurting someone. Now, this point that hurt people hurt people, this is a universal principle in human psychology. Whenever people act hurtfully in a way that hurts others, it is because they themselves are hurting. And that's why rather than just focusing on why is this person hurting me so much, it, okay, how is this person hurting themselves? Because of which they are doing like this. That is a way in which we 
can change the focus. Instead of blaming the other person, we can start understanding the other person. So I'll move to the next point after this. But at this point, any comments or questions? Okay, good question. So, why did Mantra try to push or uh, try to go like this? We can actually trace this parampara of hurt people, hurt people in a sequence. So, Mantra had a hunchback. And because of that hunchback, because she, she didn't have a very attractive form. So she was sometimes the butt of friendly teasing by others. And it was never malicious, but it was always there. And she would feel angered, she would feel irritated, she would feel infuriated by that. But when, so now she, Mantara actually had come, she was a maid of Kaiki before her marriage also, in the Kaiki kingdom. So when she came with Kaikei to Dashrath's palace, at that time, as Kaikei started becoming the favorite queen, so along with that, Mantra's position also went up in the palace. So whereas earlier, people might joke at her, now, when they realize that she is the favorite maid of the favorite queen of the king, then nobody dared make fun of her. And she became a very influential person in the whole palace. And she feared the loss of that position. If Kaikai is not the favorite queen of Ram, then I won't be the favorite maid of the favorite queen. And I will become just like another servant in the royal palace. And that made her insecure. And that insecurity made her act in a terrible way. So in order to protect her position, she felt Kaikai has to protect her position. And for protecting that position, she goaded Kaikai to do something terrible. Okay. Any other questions? The second point I'll make here is that just because some action is understandable doesn't mean that it is excusable. Just because we understand why somebody did like that or even why we did something, why we acted in the particular, that doesn't mean it is excusable. So when we are our when we say we should understand people, that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to accept everything that they are doing. So there are certain actions which are which are wrong. Which are wrong. That means what? I gave started the example of say if we accidentally put our foot on at least on somebody's foot. Now they may push us away. Now when they push us away, at one level they are trying to protect themselves. But if instead of pushing us away, if they suddenly punch us, punch us forcefully in the belly or the chest or the face, that would be an excessive reaction. Now when if this person is getting pushed away, they get angry, how dare you push me? And then they took out and take out a knife to hit the other person, to stab the other person. That would also be excessive. So, there are, when we are hurt, it's natural and it's understandable that we want to protect ourselves. And in protecting ourselves, we may be impelled to do certain things. But, there is a consideration of proportion. So, when we want to understand people, the point is not to excuse whatever they are doing. Because sometimes, uh, be they may be reacting in a disproportionate way. When they are reacting in a disproportionate way, that is something which has to be uh, which has to be corrected. 
in, in law, in, in justice, the principle is that the punishment should be proportional to the crime, not proportional to the anger we feel at the crime. If somebody has done something wrong, sometimes there is mob justice or it's called vigilante justice. That means if a particular person is found to be a criminal or is suspected to be a criminal, then people just come together and lynch that person, attack and kill that person. Now that is excessive, that is disproportionate and that is undesirable. So, when people act in a very excessive way, when people uh, act, uh, act disproportionately, that is unhealthy. So, when we are we're talking about understanding people, that is not about excusing them. Because if we start, one of our fears is that once I understand, oh, this person acted like this, because of this way, then I have to, I have to accept the victim the way they are. That is a separate question. Sometimes certain behaviors are acceptable, understandable. Some people, some behaviors are understandable, but still they are not acceptable. Sometimes some behaviors are understandable, but they are not at all, they are condemnable still. They, they are wrong. So, when we say hurt people, hurt people, that doesn't mean that what a person does is excusable. Because when we are hurt, at that time, our emotions can make us lose our sense of proportion. So for, okay, for doing this or for not doing this, what, how much should I act? How much should I not act? That is something which we require our intelligence to consider. Now if you consider an example from the Mahabharata here, one example of hurt people, hurt people can be Karna. Karna was from his childhood always insecure. What was his insecurity? What was his insecurity? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, he was, he was not accorded the privilege of being a warrior, of being a Kshatriya. He was labelled as a Sutaputra. Now this naturally was hurting him. And in the Swayamvar of Draupadi, when he came forward with his bow to compete, at that time he was told that this Swayamvar only Kshatriyas can participate. Now it is a disgrace for him. He comes forward to compete and then he is told you can't compete. So suddenly it was a dishonor for him. However, if we look at the broader context, we will see that it was a competition of Kshatriyas. After that when Arjun came to compete, Arjun before that asked, he asked, uh, Arjun at that time, he was in what dress? Yes, he was a Brahman at that time. So as a Brahman, what he first asked, are Brahmanas allowed to compete in this way? So when he stepped forward, by that time all the Kshatriyas had competed and all the, none of them had been able to reach, hit the target. Actually, many times when these uh, swayamvars would happen, the swayamvars would sometimes be arranged in such a way that the, the bride and her father would, would make the competition in such a way that only the particular groom whom they wanted to marry, that person alone would be able to meet the target. So they had arranged this archery contest in such a way that Arjun alone would be able to hit the target. It was extremely difficult. So you could say that this was match fixing, swayamvar fixing. 
but it is not exactly fixing in an analytical sense. There was a fair competition, and the best the best groom would uh, win. The best suitor would win up the groom. But what is best depends on the arena, the competition. What is the competition set in which you have to see the best? So Drupada had a desire that Arjun become his groom, become his son-in-law. And that's why when he got Draupadi as a daughter, he, he had a desire. So then he had arranged the company in such a way that actually one has to look down and shoot an arrow up through a wheel. And that wheel is rotating and above that there is a fish. There is a replica of a fish. And the eye of the fish has to be extremely difficult to get. So all the Kshatriyas by that time had tried and failed. And then finally when Arjun came forwards, at that time there was surprise in the assembly. And then some of the Brahmanas, some of the Kshatriyas started saying, hey, look at this Brahman. Brahmins are supposed to be self-controlled. But seeing the beauty of Draupadi, this Brahmin has lost his self-control. And now he's desiring the hand of Draupadi. And some Brahmanas started saying, Oh, we will make a fool of all the Brahmanas. He will not even, even be able to lift up the bow. He's come and sit down. He says, don't make, a, don't make a fool of us. And Shatriya started saying, Oh, this Brahmin, what will he be able to do? He's just fooling here. But then some Brahmanas started saying that, Oh, you see, he's well built. Maybe he will prove how the Brahmanas are greater than the Kshatriyas, even in Kshatriya skills. So whenever there are two centers of power, there is, there is at a subtle or a cross level, there is some competition that happens. So in the traditional culture, Brahmanas and Kshatriyas were two centers of power. Brahmanas were more centers of intellectual and spiritual power. The Kshatriyas were centers of political and uh, <coughs> administrative power. But there was certainly tension. Now those who are mature, they manage the tension and work cooperatively. But some people, they can't manage and they aggravate the tension. So, then finally, Drishtadyumna, who was the brother of Draupadi, and who was overseeing the ceremony, he consulted Drupad. And in Drupad, his heart was already sinking. Now, nobody, there's nobody who's able to win this target. His hope was that maybe Arjun is still alive, because at that time, it was reputed, it was, uh, the, rum the rumor going around was that maybe Arjun was alive. The official version of the story was that the Pandavas had been burned in the fire at Varnavat. But generally speaking, whenever there is there is anything uh, shocking, anything unfortunate, anything terrible happens, then people all, there, there is some official explanation that is given. But there are there is always people who have some doubts, some suspicions. Maybe this is not true. So the official version was that actually there is an accidental fire in which everyone was burnt. The suspected story was that maybe this was an arson, this was intentionally done by the Kauravas, by Duryodhana and others. And the further story was, maybe, although it was done by them, maybe the Pandavas survived. So he had that hope. But when nobody came forward, the Arjuna also didn't come at that time, he started losing hope. Then finally he said, yes, the Brahmana, so Drupad throw Drishtadyumna and the assembly, that the Brahmanas are venerable for the Kshatriyas. Therefore the Brahmanas, they are higher than the Kshatriyas and certainly Brahmanas can compete. So then Arjun came forward to compete. Now I'm not going to go into that story, but the point I'm making over here is that Arjun had the courtesy to ask, is a Brahman allowed to compete? Now Karna, at that time, if he had also had that caution, then it would not have been that much of a disgrace for him. He already knew that there were people who questioned uh, his position as a Kshatriya. And he could have been a little more sensitive. But he was not. He presumed that he could participate. And then he was hurt 
He naturally felt angry at that time. But then, eventually, he got back at Draupadi. And when did he get back at Draupadi? In the? Asad Sabha. What did he do? How, how did he get back at her? He used wrong words for her, that's one thing. He in endorsed Dushasana for? Yeah, yes. It was he who suggested to the Kauravas that the Draupadis are slave now, let us disrobe her. Now here you will see, this is such an outrageous idea. This is scum. So, it's one thing to break the law. It's like say to, to forcibly violate a woman, that's bad. It, it is one thing to break the law, but when people do something uh, illegal, they'll do it in private. It's quite another thing to break the law in public. That's bad enough if some criminal activity is happening, right, for everyone to see. But, if some criminal goes into a police station and there he commits a crime, there if somebody brazenly abuses or violates a woman, that would be outrageous. So when Draupadi was dishonored, it was his third degree crime. It was, this was the royal assembly where those who are wronged, they are supposed to be protected and given justice. So when Duryodhan, Dushyasana and Karana, they, they, they all try to dishonor Draupadi over there, it was not just a wrong activity, it was not just a wrong activity in public, it is a wrong activity, it is in the presence of those who were meant to stop it. So to break the law in the presence of the law, of the protectors of law, it was an extremely brazen activity. So now Karana did that, it is Karana who suggested that Draupadi be dishonored, be disrobed. And why did he suggest that? It was because he felt that she has dishonored me, I will dishonor her. She dishonored him by not allowing him to compete in this world. So I will dishonor her. But here, if we consider the proportion, for a woman to be dishonored in public like that, it is worse than death. For, for Karana, also it was painful. But here, he went completely out of proportion. And this disproportionate reaction, outrageously disproportionate reaction, is not excusable. And so when we say something can be understood, when we say hurt people hurt people, so we try to understand how the other person is hurt. That does not mean that we accept or excuse what they are doing. So when our emotions take charge of our actions, then they blind us to the sense of proportion. And we may act disproportionately. So any questions about this just now? Any questions or comments? So I'll move to the last point and then we can have further questions. So the first point I spoke was that when somebody is hurting us, look at not just why are they hurting me, but how are they hurting themselves? How are they hurt because of which they are hurting? The second point I said is that just because somebody is hurt, that doesn't mean that they, whatever they do out of that hurt is acceptable. Even understanding why people are acting doesn't mean excusing them. Because they may be acting disproportionately. And the third point which I talk about is that actually a proportionate action is the key to responsible relationships. When we are not able to get a sense of proportion, Okay, this is this, this was this much wrong. Then this is the this is the response to this. 
then what happens is people just can't relate to each other. I was in America and uh, there was a dog, uh, I just, uh, just came from America, it was three, three and a half months I was there. So there, in many American metropolitan cities, especially from Caucasians, the, not the immigrants from South America, China or India or Middle East, but the Americans who came from Europe, the Caucasians, among them, in many families, many cities, the the number of dogs in the family is more than the number of children. <laughs> so people have dogs and they so madly love with their dogs that they didn't do anything and everything. In fact, <clears throat> you see in many traditional cultures, there is no such profession as a psychologist or a psychotherapist. People would hurt, people would go through dist distress, grief, loss, and they will overcome it. Now, because people have so much mental health problems, that there are, many people have to go to psychologists, psychotherapists. Now, but there is a genre of professionals who are actually psychotherapists for dogs. <laughs> so people say, oh, my dog is not so active. I think my dog is depressed. And then, how a dog is to be counselled, who knows? <laughs> but, people just go about, they shower so much love and affection on their dogs and they spend so much money on it. So, I saw one notice, people sometimes in their cars, they put all kinds of uh, humorous or provocative, outrageous notices. So there is the one notice I saw. The more I get to know people, the more I love my dog. <laughs> so when people do not, when somehow people are not able to get along with each other, then they feel, oh, yes, I love my dog. At least my dog won't be me. My dog won't hurt me. In fact, uh, when, I was in Pune, uh, when I was in Pune several years ago, at that time from there, uh, the devotees had to publish a book. And it was based on the uh, idea that Krishna is our best friend. He is Surudam Sarvabhutana. So the title of that book that is had to do was Your Best Friend. And one devotee who had come from America, they were thinking whether we can send this book to the devotees in America also. So one devotee in America said, as soon as you use the word your best friend, people in the Western world think it must be dog. Yes, <laughs> it must be dog. <laughs> so the Bhagavad Gita says your best friend is God. <laughs> but you turn God around and you get dog, G-O-D, D-O-G. So, what has happened? People's values have become completely skewed. In the 18th chapter, Krishna says, Bhagavad Gita says that, Sarvarthan viparitamscha buddhi sapartha tamasi. In all ways, to think of things to be the opposite of what they are. Sarvarthan viparitamscha, viparit, opposite. That is intelligence in the mode of ignorance. It is distorted intelligence. So when uh, people, uh, when people are not able to have a sense of proportion, so uh, what has happened? Uh, so then they just act disproportionately. So one way is that okay, you hurt me, I'll hurt you back. Another way is that if you don't, you hurt me, I don't want to get, get involved with you. So people just stop trying to relate with each other. And people start now showering all their love on a pet, on a dog. So intelligence means to moderate our emotions so that our actions are proportionate, are proper. But when that is not there, then what happens is our relationships would get misdirected. So the the more cultures become westernized, the western uh, that westernized means more materialistic. Then more people feel lonely. Why lonely? 
Because at one level, when we become materialistic, what does becoming materialistic mean? It basically means that our desires for material things become very strong. Everybody has material desires. When we live in the world, naturally, there are, we, we desire the things of the world. But the desires can become disproportionate. And that's why Krishna says that karma is bad when it is dushpurena. Dushpurena is insatiable. Kamam ashritya dushpuram dhammanam dhanvitaha mohad gruhitva sadgrahan pravartante shuchivrataha in 16.10 Krishna says Kama doesn't necessarily refer only to lust. Kama refers to desire. If we see Krishna talks in the Bhagavad Gita in the 3rd chapter about Kama. And there in 3.36, Arjuna asks the question, Oh Krishna, what is it that makes people act against their best interests? Atakena prayuktoyam, papam charati purusha, anichanna pivajshneya, baladivani yojita. What makes people act in self-destructive ways? And what does Krishna answer in the next verse? 3.37 he says, Shri Bhagavan Vacha Kamesha Krodesha Rajoguna Samantha So he says, Kam. Now, if you consider what makes people act in self destructive ways, in ways that hurt themselves, there can be many things. So it is not just because of lust, people may act disproportionately, act destructively. Because of greed, people may act destructively. Because of envy, people may act destructively. So there can be many factors. When Krishna uses the word karma, he is using it in an inclusive sense. Any desire that hurts us, that is karma. And that's why the seventh chapter of Krishna says, Dharma avruddho bhuteshu kamosmi bharatashya. That that calm that doesn't violate dharma. That calm, that desire which does not cross the boundary of ethics. That which does not cross the boundary of dharma. That desire is Krishna says is not bad. In fact, he says that karma, I am that karma. I manifested that desire, that desire. So emotions themselves are not bad. When people when, when life hurts us, when people hurt us, it's natural to feel hurt. It's not that we have to simply deny our emotions and think that we have to be stone like. But at the same time, when emotions come, we cannot act solely based on those emotions. We have to have a rational side, an intelligence which processes those emotions. And then responds proportionately, responds appropriately. If that is not there, then we will simply keep making things worse. You did this to me, and I do this to you. Then you do this to me. That's how sometimes we may see us, uh, in the sense, among school children or among people on the street, some street fight breaks out. And usually the street fight breaks out, how? Just two people are walk, just walking along, one person pushes the other person. How dare you push me? You push him back. And if the other person pushes him back, how dare you push me like this? I punch you. You dare to punch me? The other person takes a two face, I'll bang you that. And you do that to me? And then somebody may take out or pick up a stone. Then, then the other person takes out a knife. And things suddenly keep getting worse and worse and worse. So when emotions rule our decisions, then we make mountains out of mountains. When emotions rule our decisions, we make small things huge. And that's when relationships fall apart. Kaikai, she had a natural human concern. But the way she acted on her concern was destructive, was disastrous. So when, if our intelligence is strong, then we will be able to process that emotion properly. So Kaikai, what could she have done in that situation? 
she could before demanding from Dasharat that sent Ram out to the forest. She, before demanding like that, she could have asked. No, that, you know, why, why is this ceremony being done so suddenly? So how she could have acted more responsibly in that particular relationship, in that particular situation, I'll discuss elaborately in tomorrow's class. But at this point, I would just make this point that intelligence means that we uh, acknowledge our emotions, but we don't act solely based on our emotions. We accept, yes, I am feeling hurt. But just because I am feeling hurt doesn't mean I will respond only based on that hurt feeling. We learn to be a, we learn to be able to acknowledge our emotion, but not act based solely on the emotion. And this capacity can be developed by our spirituality. The more we grow spiritually, the more we start understanding that I am not my emotions. My emotions come from my mind, but I am different from my mind. I am a soul. The soul is different not just from the body, but the soul is different even from the mind. And the more we practice bhakti, the, that is how we realize our spirituality. We understand that I am a soul who exists above my body and above my mind. We exist at a level higher than our situations and higher than our emotions. Situations are real. The emotions that we feel in those situations are also real. But whether what those emotions are telling me to do they are really the best response. That is something which I, as a soul, can and should evaluate. So that intelligence can be developed by the practice of bhakti. Now, how we can develop that intelligence and how we can respond more, uh, in a more balanced, more mature way, how we can become response-able, able to choose a right response. That's how we will be able to develop responsible relationships. Rather than simply hurting each other because of what the other person has done, we will be able to stop that cycle of hurting each other and then see how we can help heal each other. And that is the way to having healthy and harmonious relationships. So I'll summarize and then if there are any questions, we can discuss. I spoke today in this first part the topic of responsible relationships. First part is hurt people, hurt people. And I spoke three main points. First point was that when somebody hurts us, rather than uh, just feeling angry with them, we can, we can ask the question, you know, how is this person hurting? Because of which they are hurting. If somebody pushes us suddenly, it may well be because we have stepped on their foot. When carefully, uh, hurt Dashrath Maharaj terribly by demanding that Ram be exiled. It was because she was hurt. That is, she felt threatened that her privileged position as the favorite queen will be lost. And it's like the arm is weak, arm is wounded, and somebody pulls it with that arm. It becomes very difficult to resist. And Kaikai was poor. Kaikai was manipulated like that by Mantra, who also was afraid of losing her position. So, uh, it is when people are hurt, they hurt others. Uh, then, the second point was that just because people are hurt, when we understand how they are hurt, that doesn't mean that we excuse what they are doing. Because uh, when, uh, there might be people who are acting disproportionately. So, in justice, the principle is punishment should be proportional to the wrongdoing not to the outrage felt at the wrong way. Otherwise, there will be lynching and mob violence. So therefore, I talked talk about Karna. He felt dishonored during Draupadi Swamvar. And as a, to get back at her, he tried to dishonor her during the gambling match. But the sense of proportion was completely lost. And he ended up acting terribly against the values of Akshantri. 
he had wanted uh, he had, he had wanted the honor of a kshatriya and he was hurt because he did not get that honor but kshatriya the essence of a kshatriya is one who protects others kshatratraya but he ended up acting opposite of kshatriya by trying to dishonor a woman in public it was an extremely brazen act that to to commit a crime is bad to commit a crime in public is worse to commit a crime in the presence of those who are meant to protect the law that is most outrageous so the sense of proportion is lost when we act governed by our emotions alone the last point i talked of was that to have responsible relationships we need to uh, and we need to act not based on our emotions alone but based on our intelligence so we acknowledge the emotion we acknowledge the hurt that we are feeling but we don't act based on the emotion alone if if hurt if we hurt others because they have hurt us the end result would be that we get alienated and that alienation and loneliness in the western civilized civilization i said it comes in the form of people not wanting to be together with other people but people save lavishing their love on dogs so <laughs> this is also unfortunate so we need to develop our intelligence by which we can evaluate our emotions and the one way to develop that intelligence is by growing spiritually the more we realize ourselves as souls by practicing bhakti the more we understand that i exist above my situation and above my emotion and then i can respond in a to to a hurt not by hurting the other person back but by considering how i can be a healing influence in this situation thank you very much hare krishna comments yes please How do we understand the spiritual power with these three points? Okay. So if we say that, if we say that hurt people hurt people, then from that perspective, how do we actually go about understanding the Kurukshetra war? Yeah, it's a. If we consider the Kurukshetra war, is it? That the Panda uh, Kauravas were hurt, so they hurt the Panda. The Panda was got hurt, they wanted to hurt back the Kauravas. Is it simply that getting escalated? Yes, we could say at one level it is that. So some the small conflict it all began with Duryodhan being a pampered child. He had an entitlement mentality. He thought that I deserve to be the king. Why? Because he was the only heir at that time. He was the oldest among the Kauravas, and whether Pandu's sons would ever come back to the kingdom, it was not known. But when Pandu passed away untimely, and Pandu's sons, the Pandas, came back, because they were new in the kingdom, and because they were so cultured, having lived in among Brahmanas and sages in the forest, so all the attention and affection Duryodhan was getting, it all started going towards the Kauravas, so towards the Pandavas. and to the side of the envious so then he started conspiring to eliminate the pandavas now if we see the the pandavas tried again and again so okay so duryodhan was duryodhan was insecure duryodhan was fearful of losing his position that's why he hurt the pandavas so he tried to uh, poison bhim at that time Did you wish to say, let's get back at him, let's try to poison him? The Pandavas were always exercising restraint. The Pandavas, you wish to tell, this is a family issue, let's not get into the public. We just be more alert, but let us not point any fingers at him. Even when the Pandavas were attempted to be burnt alive in Varanamut, the Pandavas came back uh, later after them. They, they, they didn't demand the kingdom. Eventually, when they married, when the married Draupadi. it was dhritarashtra who gave them half the kingdom but even then he gave a barren half of the kingdom but the pandavas did not protest they did not try to fight they were getting hurt but they were tolerating it then eventually in the gambling match they were they were dishonored dropadi was disrobed they were disposed of everything 
they went, they went to the forest. Then the Pandavas went to the, into the forest for 13 long years. When they came back, at that time they had full right to wreak vengeance. But they did not do that. They petitioned for peace. And what did Duryodhana do? He tried to arrest Krishna. So, when Draupadi was dishonored, at that time a line was crossed. And, <coughs> uh, more or less, at that point, the war became inevitable. Because there are limits to what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. So they, they had, the Kauravas had crossed that acceptable, unacceptable, limit of being unacceptable. But still the Pandavas were ready to petition for this. However, Duryodhan was not reconciliatory and he was not even remorseful. Remorseful means acknowledge I did something wrong. Reconciliatory means let's make let's back things up. He was not interested in anything at all. When, the, when Krishna said just give five villages, what did Duryodhana say? I will not give you enough land to put the tip of the needle through. And this is like this is not just the no to a request; it is no to a person. I suppose. Yeah, you, all of you, I heard that you have this magnificent uh, Damodar outreach. It's told almost like in 1300, uh, 1300 houses you went to. It is amazing. So many people you are able to reach out. It's wonderful. So suppose you reach out to somebody like that and do a program and then you invite them for a program. Uh, for a pro bigger program in the temple and they say, Actually, you know, I want this thing, I want that thing, so I can't come for the program. Now, that's understandable. Now, maybe it's real, it may not be real. But at least, they have the politeness to say that I can't come because of this, this, this. But suppose somebody will invite for a program. And they say, even if I die, my dead body will not come to your program. <laughs> <laughs> that is not just a no to the request. That is a banging in the banging the door in the face of the person. It's a no to the person itself. So Duryodhana's response was like that. I will not give enough land even to put the tip of a needle through. So then that meant that there was no way things could be resolved. So, Dur so the Pandavas tried their best to avoid hitting back at the Kauravas. All the Kauravas were hitting them again and again and again and again. But when the Kauravas were not remorseful at all, they are still brazen and arrogant, then the Pandavas fought the war not just to take revenge. The Pandavas fought the war to establish the war. If a person as brazen as Duryodhan, who could attempt to dishonor a royal lady in the royal assembly, if he got unchallenged power, and what he could do would, be, would make, a, make our imagination shudder. Therefore, the Pandavas, as Kshatriyas, as the Maharishi guardians of society, had a duty to protect their citizens. And thus, they fought to establish that. So, it's the Pandavas fighting the Kurukshetra war is not just simply hurt people, and hurt people getting, exaggerated, exaggerated, getting exaggerated. It is that one person keeping hurting, hurting, hurting and going beyond all limits of humanity and uh, uh, civility, then he had to be punished. Okay? Thank you. Any other questions? Any other? Okay. Yes. Sanji, you said the point, second point uh, about no, all whatever you have people are inexcusable. Uh, so, so you know you don't have to excuse them. Yeah. At the same time, in the point number three, you talked about how with the help of spirituality you are able to actually respond to that situation. Uh, somehow I am not able to actually reconcile these two things. For example, how Pandavas, there was a limit to which you know they could actually take it and they actually had to fight the war. Yes. So so a solution I feel better for personally would be to actually you know, walk away, even though you talked about being alienated, being a walk away would be a better solution rather than 
you know, uh, because it's like an inexcusable in my head, somebody was hurt me. So walking away is a better solution than actually fighting that or responding to that and trying to be actually better, you know, manage that situation. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if somebody has hurt us, then trying to think that that, that situation is not excusable and uh, still trying to respond maturely would be quite difficult. So he said that then he might, is walking away from it not better? <clears throat> it depends on what the relationship is. It depends on what kind of uh, situation, what kind of hurting situation has happened. And uh, walking away is one option. But that is not necessarily the best option always. You have to see according time, place, circumstance. So, if uh, what would work the best? Suppose if it's a if it's a particular relationship in which uh, not much is at stake. Say we are working with someone, and we find that this is too complicated. Say we are working at a job. And you find there's too much backbiting and politics and stuff like that. You don't want to get involved in that. I just decided that I'll go and take some other job. That's perfect. That's okay. But this idea of walking away can lead to people uh, becoming very casual about their relationships. Sometimes, say, if a, a couple can't get along with you, say, so you hurt me so much. I'm just not going to stay with you. And that can lead, that walking away can be one solution, but it can actually jeopardize the stability of relationships. So, I'll talk about walking away, about the three, three broad responses when we are in a, in a painful situation that I'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, so, but walking away can be done when, the, when either the solution doesn't seem to be resolvable at all, or there is not much, much at stake for us. But sometimes walking away could be just a shortcut. I was in America, I was, in, I was at a college program. I went for several times for that program. So after that, this one, some student was coming regularly. I was talking with him. And he told me that he grew up in a, he grew up in a, in a foster care. Now normally, children grow up in foster care when they don't have any parents. So it's foster care is like in between an orphanage and a normal home. But some family, they don't legally adopt the child. But it's like they keep take care of the child for some time. And that may be for a few months, few years, depending on how it goes. So he said, in foster care, I went through many, many families. So then I asked him, so what happened? Did your parents pass away in an accident or something? He said, no, both my parents are alive. I said, what? Then, then, why, then why do you have to go to foster care? So he said that, actually when I was five, my parents separated. And at that time, both of them, they told me that this marriage was the biggest mistake of our lives. And they both told their child, this boy, that you remind me of the biggest mistake of my life. And both the parents said, I don't want anything to do with you. Because I want to forget this chapter of my life. And this boy was just with two parents, suddenly became homeless. And then he became a ward of the state and he had to he had to go from home to home, foster home to foster. So he was telling me that when now he's trying to become a devotee. So whenever he hears of God as a father or as a mother, he says, I don't want God to be like my father or my mother. <laughs> so it's very sad. It's heartbreaking actually. So walking away is uh, sometimes in the worst case, there is no other solution that may have to be done. But it cannot be taken as the, as the sole solution. So there is, I'll be talking in a future session also that there is there is, I gave a whole seminar in London on this topic of balancing forgiveness and justice in one. Now when something is to be forgiven, when justice is to be sought. So when I talk about these two things, that 
And the second point I said is that something is not excusable. Uh, and third point I said is that we should rise above our emotions and act properly. So that means, that doesn't mean that we just tolerate it passively. If somebody has hurt us, then we may have to respond appropriately to it. All that we are saying is that when hurt people hurt people, then the response is inappropriate, is excessive and it simply makes things worse. So walking away can be a worst case solution, but it, may, it needn't be the first solution. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, with regards to the hurt hurt uh, situation, you said that then, uh, let's say two persons decide to alienate themselves. So, uh, and then you said that the solution could be practicing a spiritual. So, if one person decides to practice spiritual, how does. And if that works out for that person, how does that work? How does that person get back to the other person if it is? That, do you think that can happen? Okay, so if two people have become alienated because of just mutually hurting each other, and then one of them becomes spiritual, and they can rise above this channel of hurting each other, then can they get back together at the, with the other person? Yes, it depends on both parties, but broadly speaking, <clears throat> most people are not bad. Most people don't want to deliberately go out and hurt someone else. <laughs> Just circumstances uh, can make even good people do bad things. So what we can do in any situation is that we can try to act according to our principles. Our principles means that, I'll talk about this more elaborately in a future session, but for example, say, in this situation, whatever the other person does, I will try to act reasonably. Now reasonably doesn't mean that I take unreasonable views. But sometimes it may be that when I start acting reasonably, the other person may also start becoming reasonable. So if both of us have been unreasonably, excessively hurting each other, then I start acting reasonably. Then what happens? Sometimes the other person may also become reasonable. And if the other person becomes reasonable, then the issue gets resolved. And then things move forward. So all that we have in our control in any relationship is, is how we respond to the other person. So sometimes when we become reasonable and we persevere in acting in a reasonable way, then the other person gradually starts becoming reasonable. And then there's a possibility of reconciliation. But sometimes the other person just uh, holds the past in between. You are like that. And therefore, I can't trust you anymore. Then it may not be possible. But we shouldn't presume that it is not possible. Our spirituality should actually thicken our skin. Now, thicken our skin means I should be able to, we should be able to tolerate more. That doesn't mean that anything and everything we tolerate and we just tolerate everything. It's just that we, we don't let other people's hurting actions or hurt driven actions determine our responses. So we can say that <clears throat> if you consider in the Ramayana and Sugreen promised that I will help Ram to find Sita. But after four months, he was still caught in rebellion. He forgot about it. Then Lakshmana is so angry. How dare you forget Ram is living in the forest in great agony, separated from Sita, and you are enjoying over here? So then he was furious. But at that time, Hanuman and Tara intervened. And I told that actually, you know, he uses a monkey, just got carried away right now. But he's already arranged for monkeys to come back. And once he did that, Lakshman also calmed down. And when Lakshman calmed down, afterwards, Sukhri did not let Ramana and Lakshman down again. He was never tempted. Later on, Ravana came and Ravana tried to tempt Sukhri. He said that, no, I have not done anything wrong to you. 
I had an alliance with uh, Wali. And let us, I will continue the alliance with you. Now you are the one that He says, You just leave now. But he did. And he said, I will give you a, we'll form a treaty on very favorable terms for you. But he didn't get tempted at that time. So that means, at one time, because of situation, he acted in a bad way. And actually, the Ram Lakshman had a reason to feel hurt. But Lakshman calmed down and gave. Uh, gave Sugri a chance and then Sugri reformed. That is also possible. So we can only, all that we can do is we can try to act reasonably and hope and pray that the other person also starts acting reasonably. Then there is a reconciliation that is possible. Okay. So thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhakta Vinda ki, Gaur Premanande. Chaitanya Sri Ramdas Prabhu Ji Ki I take my question